Okay. Like like true podcast novices, we had some issues, but I think we're going now. I see these beautiful peaks and valleys. I feel so much better. Excellent. That's good. I've got them going too. All by mine, we're already already there. Uh, I mean, you don't have to brag. <laughs> hey, you know, I'm not bitter. We got you there eventually. Just a couple of YouTube videos and forum posts later. I mean, I had to open my terminal, which always makes me feel like a fucking hacker. So that was kind of cool. Yeah, you had the like the black screen, bright green letters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I got to say I'm in the mainframe. <laughs> Good. Always yeah. a plus. You need that. Okay. Everyone needs that in their life. Yeah. Um. All right. Well, we should get going. Let's um, let's I'm, do it. I'm now impatient to start because of that whole <laughs> that whole drama. It okay. sapped your um. It sapped your pre episode banter energy. Yeah, I don't. I don't have time for that now. I'm. I'm done with it. <laughs> it's over. It's time to put away childish things. Yeah. Sorry, guys. No jokes today. Jokes is gone. <laughs> This is strictly, strictly <laughs> academic content now. Only educational. No, that's not true. Don't worry. Um, okay, so welcome to Teach Me Communism. Hey, this time I didn't forget the name on our first try. I forgot our name. It was yeah, um, it was endearing in its way, but it's better this way. <laughs> yeah, that's more professional. Um, yeah, Teach Me Communism. I'm I'm happy with that name. We we had quite the brainstorm session over it. It was good. Um, Yeah, so basically, I want to know more about socialism and communism. Oh, I'm Christine also, by the way. And I'm Grady. I'm her brother. And uh, I've got kind of a background in education. You know, I've taught in public schools before. And um, I am also just a big time nerd, major geek about this stuff, about leftism in general. I read about this stuff uh, online, on Wikipedia, on various leftist posts and stuff like that. Uh, So I've done quite a lot of independent research that's of basically no use except for in this application. So, okay, what is what is your most obscure Wikipedia find? Uh, Like, what's the most specific page that you found yourself on in Wikipedia? Yeah. Uh, gosh, that's an that's a gotcha. I don't know. Um, mine is probably very specific, like English counties, because I really like their bad flag design. Okay. Mine is going to be related then. Uh, mine's going to be, it's, it's a thing called like, uh, uh rotten burrows or something like that. Uh, <laughs> What's that rotten mean? Bur- let's see. Is it rotten burrows? Yeah. Rotten and pocket burrows. Uh, basically in England, whenever they first designed the parliament system, you know, like they, created every all all the hey these are the jurisdictions they didn't ever Mm -hmm. do anything like redistricting like we do for a really long time and so you had like just tiny little villages and hamlets and stuff that they thought you know hey this is this place is going to be a center of population or whatever people just moved out instead and so you had like constituencies of like six people (gasps) <gasps> like ghost towns. Yeah, but they actually elected a member of parliament, so the you know they were really ripe for bribery. There, you could get like oh, six just, different. They're like yeah, it's like laundering basically. Uh-huh. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if that's the right use of that term. Well, you could just... as listeners will discover, I'm the one that doesn't know things. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could buy off those votes and and have you like several different like uh, of these pocket boroughs, and and have them under your control because they represented like twelve people. You know. Okay, so they're the equivalent of like North Dakota here. Yeah, they're North. They're Wyoming. The Wyoming of. <laughs> they're uh, Wyoming. Yeah, of Britain. That's the most ex- obscure. I love that. I also love. I love the word Hamlet so much. Do you think Hamlet the guy was like? He knew he was named after a small town. <laughs> just That's like being like my name, small town Rick. Yeah. <laughs> Hamlet was just a small town boy. Yeah. Oh, he was. He is emo as fuck. Okay, um, <laughs> let's get back to it. That was a fun tangent. Um, all right, so why why are we doing this? Um, I can answer that. I have very strong opinions about communism and socialism, mostly socialism. I've been a socialist for a few years now. I was on the Bernie train, all that good stuff. Um, but lately I've been dipping my toes into more like communist media. I've been listening to some podcasts, getting into like leftist Twitter. I opened a Twitter in the year of our Lord 2020. I'm a maniac apparently. (laughs) Um, I already had one, but I, I revived it. 
which is insane to do. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm I'm new to this community, and I feel like there's a lot of lingo going around that I don't know. And there's just like a, a base level knowledge that I don't have because it's not taught here in the States. And I just like, I want to be prepared when people come at me with arguments about like why communism is quote unquote bad. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, that's good. That's because there is, you're right, there's a lot of lingo out there, you know, with any sort of subculture, you're going to get a little bit of that. Um, and <clears throat> you're right, it isn't taught in schools or more broadly you know, we we, we kind of have a national uh, code or a national like I- ideal of you know, oh, free market, freedom, liberty is the good thing, <laughs> and you know, you don't want to be like those bad other countries where there isn't freedom, you know, because of whatever. It's it's basically propaganda, right? Um, it's in schools, but it's in movies. It's in pretty much every kind of culture that you that you, that we consume yeah for sure like we don't see any positive sc- stories about this like we watch what was that we watched this tom hanks movie was it tom hanks no it was robin williams um it was a little Mount moscow on the hudson or something like that okay and it was robin williams was like he he defected from the soviet union it was in the 80s and it was basically just a whole ad for like defecting <laughs> right. like it was it was very weird too because a lot of it was like him like fucking this younger girl and stuff and i'm just like this is a very like we couldn't get through it it was so long and we're like what is the plot here besides like come to america and like sleep with young beautiful women and like wear jeans like, that <laughs> yeah, was literally drink coke <laughs> the, yeah it was so weird like a big plot line was jeans it was hilarious uh, well, you know we can they can do a whole episode on on this, but Gorbachev, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, the like last Soviet premier, when he visited the uh, uh, America, like apparently he was the you know the story goes he was just completely won over by American you know consumerism and a widespread ability uh, widespread availability of everything in like the grocery stores and stuff. Like, yeah, wow, you know, look at all the stuff. I got to get the people of Russia this. Uh, I mean, it's the one thing we do well is, you know, material <laughs> abundance. We have uh, a lot of shit. So it makes sense that a movie glorifying us would, would be focused on that. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's true. But yeah, I, I just, I figured I kind of want a resource for this. So maybe other people will too. So like, hopefully, hopefully people like it. I don't know. We will see. All right. What's our first, uh, our first topic going to be? What okay. do you want to learn about? I w- what do you want me to teach you? I want to set this up. So do you remember, um, I think it was in, in Mr. White's classroom, actually. Mr. White was our history teacher mm. back in the day. Yeah. U.S. history, what was that, sophomore? No, junior yeah, year. Yeah, junior year. He had a poster, um, and it was it was like a bunch of cows. Do you remember this yes. poster? Okay, so for anyone listening who wants to look this up, here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a test Google to see if I can find oh, it. Oh, yeah, cow you can find poster, it. Mm-hmm. Political, political cow poster is probably a good way to get to it. Um, and it shows you the different forms of government via a cow metaphor. Uh, I'm pulling it up now because I just really want to see it. I missed it. Um, I spent a lot of time looking at it because, like, I'm a fucking cartoon nerd. So, like, and I was, like, right next to it also. So it would be things like representative doc- democracy. You have two cows. You elect someone with the best face for TV to tell you how to take care of your cows. <laughs> um, and I spent, like, a lot of time looking at this. And, like, you know, I was, like... 16 or something and i remember right away being like oh well communism's the best one here <laughs> like clearly because it's it's like oh you like yeah you take care of the cows together you, and you share the milk you have two cows your neighbors help you take care of them and everyone shares the milk it's like a storybook it's just like wow <laughs> let's do that that's like the good exactly. ending to any children's story yeah um so i i bring that poster up because um I would like to learn about systems of government in the sense that I do not know the difference between socialism and communism. And I, they are completely conflated in so many media mm-hmm. st- uh, like sources and stories and stuff like that. Yeah. So I just, I genuinely don't know the difference at this point. Well, uh, and you're, you're not meant to, that's what they're, that's what they were trying to do in, you know, in this most recent little cycle here with with bernie being in the race they were saying oh he's a communist you know and and trying to do all that i mean it's pretty clear here if you remember your cow political ideology that (laughs) socialism is where you have two cows the government takes them and puts them in a barn with everyone else's cows then gives you as much milk as it thinks you need 
I mean, okay. Even this cow poster, looking back, is very propaganda-ish. It is. Um, <laughs> that one's not, you know, not the best representation of socialism. However, it does. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll let's let's talk about it. All right. Difference between socialism and communism, right? And here, what I want you to do is stop me anytime you're like, no, what the hell does that mean? Okay. I turn on, I, I brought up my video again because uh, listeners don't know this, but you are a very animated speaker. So yeah, I had to see I, that hand <laughs> motion. <laughs> yep. Uh, it really helps. I, yeah, that's, that's me. Um, all right. So I'm not going to get into too much of the meat of this like in detail because it, it would, we would have a two hour long episode, but the difference between socialism and communism boils down to, you got to get to Marxism. All right. So Karl Marx, this mm -hmm. guy, uh, if yeah. listeners, you want to Google him, beard. he's the, yeah, he's the guy with the big beard, mostly bald, you know, that guy looks like, uh, old German Santa Claus. <laughs> he does, doesn't he? And, uh, Karl Marx, you know, his theory and, and Frederick Engels, his academic kind of partner guy come up, develop the theory of Marxism or, uh, a way of looking at history that's that's different than what people had been doing before. Wait, who was Engels? Was he like his bud? Yeah, he was. He was uh, his a fellow. He was just like Marx. He, you know, an economist, philosopher, kind of guy. Okay, so they're like academics. Yeah. Okay. They work together, and um, the the best way to understand this the the difference in their approach of history. Uh, before that, people kind of looked at history as as great people doing big things. You know. Yeah. Here's a picture of someone doing this, here's a picture of someone doing that. They're not super related. It's all individuals. Yeah, individuals or big events or things like that, right? Um, yeah. Whereas Marx saw this instead as one connected, you know, history is like one connected, flowing, always changing state, always developing through what he called it, the class struggle. Um, and so history went through different phases. Uh, and, and it kind of, you know, it's different for different societies, but... You start with like the primitive phase where we're all just like hunter gatherers, you know, mm -hmm. we're just hanging out, no agriculture, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's dangerous, rough and tumble and everything, but basically people are uh, equal. Yeah, no, I, I'm actually reading this book about the history of marriage. Uh, it's very good. It's called Marriage of History. And they talk about how in like Neolithic societies and like Paleolithic societies, I get those mixed up. Um that women and men were a lot more equal because it's like we literally need everybody to hunt down this mammoth so like ain't nobody can go sit down like <laughs> yes that's and that gets to the heart of it you know why were why was it so equal is because they all had to work to produce enough food for everyone to survive yeah it was so dire there was no other option right and this is a key insight of marx is that the structure of society is based on its what we call means of production the way that it okay. gets by. All right. So okay. because they had to do that to survive, that's why their society was structured that way. Okay. That's helpful because if whenever I hear means of production, I'm just like, is that a factory? Mm. Like yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, in, in today's modern context, yeah, it's, it's whatever makes means of production is just whatever you use uh, to make other things. All right. You apply, okay. apply people, just add people and you can, uh, you can make stuff out of it. That's means of production. Okay. Uh, so society changes based on those changing circumstances. So once we settle down to do agriculture, all right, the agricultural mm -hmm. revolution or Neolithic revolution, you start s producing surplus food, extra food. And now you can support uh, people uh, at the top, powerful people to direct society, to organize society, to do all this agriculture, but not like to work themselves. <laughs> yeah. So that's where you start to see different social classes. So it moves through different stages, you know, slave society where you have masters and slaves, you know, think like the pharaohs and all the mm -hmm. or like kings and emperors, that sort of thing. Uh, eventually you transition, you know, the class struggle eventually resolves itself in the destruction of that society and you bring forth feudalism, you know. Okay, There's no, one sec. Yeah. I want to go back. Yeah, let's go back. So you talked about how, okay, now we have a food surplus so I was always taught that like food surplus meant like now we can get artisan goods like pottery and whatever. Mm -hmm. um, they never talked about how like, okay, now this necessarily means we have to have a person in charge. Why, why is that? Uh, it's that way because of the uh, different factors in different places. Some places needed irrigation uh, 
built in and everything to to be able to produce like in in Egypt and everything you had to irrigate the Nile yeah um, it depends on where you are but if you had to have that you had to organize people to to work on that to work on the okay. irrigation so you systems. basically had someone to you had to have someone to tell people what to do for like larger projects. For larger projects, for defense, um, once you had enough uh, mm. people, you could, if people started to to rob other people or, or commit crimes in general, you would have some sort of a state to, you know, enforce the law of that or to uh, protect against outside invaders. And they would basically take, this is my theory of uh, government as mafia, but they would basically take protection <laughs> money, you know, taxes from yeah, various places yeah. to ensure that they would protect you from the, you know, barbarians or whatever. Yeah, because I was just jumping ahead. I'm like, well, why Why do we need people in charge? Like, why, <laughs> why could you just use the extra surplus to, like, get your shit done? You don't, but they they need, you know... They, they needed it at the time. The people in charge are saying that you need them, so... <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, feudalism. So, yeah, you, you transition to feudalism, which is essentially, like, you don't have the big guy at the top anymore, so all the cities are, like, building up their walls and their castles and protecting themselves... Um, but you still have the same dynamic, like the vassals and the serfs. You know, the vassals okay. are like, hey, stick with me and I'll protect you. Produce on the land that I have and I'll keep you alive and look out for you. Yeah. Yeah. I just rewatched Downton Abbey, so I get you. There you go. Yeah. Downstairs, <laughs> basically. I'm ready. Uh, and then eventually you have the bourgeois revolutions. Okay. Uh, bourgeoisie or bourgeois is like the... Okay. Adjective of it, maybe. But the bourgeoisie is just his term, Marx's term for the, you know, the capitalists. Okay. I thought it was like middle class. Um, There's something called the petty bourgeoisie, which is the middle class. But the bourgeoisie proper are the people in charge of the means of production. Oh, okay. Got it. So when you say something is bougie. Yeah. (laughs) That means it's capitalist. Yeah. It's it's like rich and... and, Okay. But with, um, with this rise of the bourgeoisie or whatever to power it it kind of is fueled by both the discovery of the new world to from the perspective <laughs> of america right uh, of, yeah of europe. great discovery <laughs> yeah from the perspective of europe uh finding all these natural resources to take at gunpoint um and uh the industrial revolution yeah when you have the industrial revolution you really start to see capitalism you know fully take power fully take off it's basically like the transfer of power from the feudal estates, all the like kind of rural counties and stuff to the cities. Mm-hmm. All right. The cities where the burgs, yeah. like, you know, Pittsburgh or something, burgers, that's where bourgeoisie, uh-huh. that word comes from. Oh, yeah. that's cool. Like Burger Meister Meister Burger. There you go. Yeah. Classic. <laughs> he bourgeoisie. is. He's classic bourgeois. Yeah. He's so bougie. Um, he, oh my gosh. He is. He's such an <laughs> asshole. Uh, so. Essentially, this is where when Marx, you know, took up his pen and said, we're in this age, the capitalist age, you know, it's bourgeoisie. And then uh, the, you have their workers, the proletariat, the working class. Okay. All right. So a lot of this is just about resource grabbing. It's about, yeah, it's about who is in charge of the resources and who has to work the resources. And then okay. those classes having different interests from each other, right? Like classic boss. What does your boss want you to do? He wants as much work from you as, as he can get but while paying you as little as possible. As little as possible, which is why I always like highball my salary asks. Yes, for um, sure. Any women aligned folks out there, just remember they will pay so much more money than than you're going to ask for. Just Just be ridiculous about it. I literally tell people when they ask for commissions and stuff or like, like, so, like, I'm an artist, and so mm-hmm. um, I do commissions, and people often ask, like, how much should I charge for commissions? I'm like, figure out your hourly salary based on, like, how much you'd like to make in a year. Do that math. And then fucking double it. Because, like, it's you're not just paying for my time. You're paying for, like, the years I went to art school and the years I've spent practicing and my, like, iPad that I used to draw. Like, you're paying for a lot more than just, like, the 30 minutes it takes me to crank out a portrait. Hey, yeah, that's smart. I mean, that's the justification for the high prices of like doctors and lawyers and stuff, right? Is that uh, like, oh, they had so much of so much, so many years of, of law school, to, you know, med yeah, school they got to pay off that money. Yeah. Well, that makes like, sense. Art school ain't cheap either. <laughs> What's your success rate on that? Is that is it works? Um, it works for me. Do they usually just go with that? You know, like say, hey, double. Yeah, do it. They don't know it's double, but. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I don't tell them that it's doubled. One of the things I work very quickly, like not to brag, but I just 
I just do because my my style is very like cartoony and simple. Mm-hmm. So I just knock things out very quickly. So it does it just does not behoove me to charge hourly like oh, that. Yeah. I would lose money. Yeah. So. For sure. Yeah. So I just am like, okay, I think this is worth this much and I just stick with it. And people are willing to pay for it. Like it's it's not too bad. Nice. So in, in any of these stages, you have these different interests, right? So the proletariat, they want to not have to do as, as much work and get more pay. All right. They, they, they want to. Their idea is they, they only have, they don't own any means of production. Like they don't own a factory. They don't own land. They own themselves. They can yeah. sell their labor. That's what they can do. That's what they have yeah, at their they're disposal. Selling their bodies essentially. Yeah. They're temporarily, you know, putting themselves at the disposal of this employer. Um and he says, Okay, we're in this stage, we're in this sta- uh, this capitalist stage. And he starts kind of going from his theory to predict what will happen next and say, Okay, well, based on what's been going on, um, eventually what he calls modern industry will combine and grow and become more monopolistic. Oh, doesn't sound familiar at all. <laughs> oh, what are you talking about? <laughs> right? I mean, uh, he, it's it's eerie sometimes, but he's like, yeah, you know, you're going to get everything big com- combinations. Uh, and in doing so, you know, what the capitalists are pursuing profit, but the workers are are getting combined this way too. And as they do so, they're going to increase their consciousness. They're going to figure out, hey, you know, what the fuck? This guy is is really screwing us over here, you know, and they're going to start combining, you know, into labor organizations, realizing that they are kind of united um, and mm-hmm. eventually overthrow the system, right? Just like any of the other uh, systems we've had, they've eventually resolved into something else. So yeah, one thing, when companies combine... Like, I view it as bad, so I'm like, that seems like it should be illegal. Um, but I feel like consumers often see it as good. Like, you know, Disney Plus is an example. Like, everyone's like, oh, great, now I can get all my Marvel and shit at the same time. I'm like, no company should own that many, like, products. Like, that's bad for, well, one, it's bad for, like, creativity. That's why every movie is the same movie now. Like, not to sound like a fucking hipster, but, like, they have to because yeah. they're selling to world markets uh-huh. and, like, you can't have queer people in certain countries. So like, it's just oh, not going to fly. Yeah. That's so true. like, yeah, I just, it's hard for me. I, I feel like people are so swayed by the convenience, like, you know, obviously Amazon stuff like that, myself mm-hmm. included. I'm a very bad socialist. Um, so like, how do we, maybe this is a longer topic, but like, how do we get people to divorce the idea of like, Oh, this is convenient for me. And also realizing like, Oh, this is bad that companies are doing this. Um, man. Yeah, no, that's a good question. I mean, <laughs> cause I do think that, yeah, it is generally convenient. It's not always most convenient, right? If you're the telecommunications guys emerging they're you know, they can just bilk you for higher prices cause you need that, you know, uh, internet, yeah. like internet providers, you internet. Know? Yeah. They're absolutely doing that. They're just like, fuck you. You need internet. Pay me. But, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's not always, but, um, I don't know. I don't know what you would do there. Uh, I mean, hey, I can make a note and we can come yeah, back to it. On that's an episode, episode idea. I'm just going to write consumerism. <laughs> yeah, because there is a, you know, it's a big tension between, uh, hey, this is good for me right now. This is cheap. Nice. You know, I get cheap free exactly. delivery from Amazon. But, you know, I'm, I'm killing somebody's back to do that or whatever. Yeah, know? exactly. Like, I don't know. Can we just rely on people to be like morally good? Because like that sounds difficult. Oh, well, this <laughs> this is something you may have heard in leftist spaces. There's no ethical consumption under capitalism. Yeah. With the Garfield meme. <laughs> OK. Yeah. With the Garfield. <laughs> um, yeah. That's what this is referring to. Like basically no matter what you do, even if you get the ethically sourced fair trade, whatever, it's going to be shitty in some respect. And it's, yeah. Um, yeah. Somebody's getting fucked over at some level. Yeah. Even the most fair situation that company is probably going to be making a profit. And if they are, then they are paying somebody less than what they're getting from them. And so exploitation. Yeah. And this is something, sorry, not to get us on this huge tangent, but no, this is something I'd want to talk about in that episode too, is, is that there's so much small business um, and like shop small kind of um, moralizing yeah. on like 
like, you know, like I'm on Instagram a lot. It's like, oh, make sure you like support creators. And like, I'm a creator. I get it. Like, please support them. But I'm also like, you shouldn't. This sucks that you have to do that. Like, I don't know. It's like, yeah, well, that's because people don't see what they really can do big picture wise. So they resort to small individual choices as a solution because it doesn't seem to be a big political. I mean, it's like the environmental movement. Mm -hmm. Same, same thing. Yeah. Okay. Let's get back on track. All right. Yeah, back to uh, workers hanging out. I think that's where we were at. Right, yeah. So the next stage being uh, as being brought about by workers kind of combining, uh, figuring out their united class interests, and that they you know need to take power for themselves to quit getting screwed over by so the capitalists. basically it's like workers being like, hey, I'm not getting paid enough. Are you getting paid enough kind of thing? Right. Which, oh, also, pro tip, I also do this. Talk about your salaries with people. I hate that there's a culture of not talking about your salaries. It is a way to get us to be paid less. It's intentional, um, yeah. Especially do this if you're a woman or, you know, non-binary person or a queer person because, like, they will screw you over. Like, I, I make it a point to tell all my friends, like, whenever they look for jobs, I'm like, what are they, what are they offering? Because I want to make sure that it's fair. Yeah. So talk about your fucking money, please. <laughs> and as the workers are talking about their money and figuring out and coming to the larger conclusion that, hey, it doesn't matter how much they pay us. They're, you know, why are they paying us that? Because they're making more. You know, uh, we should. Why should they get to skim off of, off of the top from us? We should make that. Let's take power. Let's let's take it from them. Let's let's be the bosses ourselves. And when they figure that out, when they uh, that cataclysm comes, a revolution comes, and they destroy uh, the power of the bourgeoisie and take uh, power for themselves, that's socialism. Okay, it's uh, socialism is where you have kind of you know our system, but instead the workers are in charge. There is no bourgeoisie okay. like holding power over. The workers. So it's still technically capitalism. I can go to a store and buy shit. You would be going to the store and buying shit. Yeah. Um, But the 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 phrase that Marx uses for uses for this is from each uh, from each according to his ability to each according to his contribution. Okay. Now we would say there nowadays, but um, what he's saying is the current system is we the workers put in the work. And the bosses take off the top and they earn income from nothing from having money. Right. Yeah. They're putting yeah. other They're people. Like, to work. I, I came up with the idea. I had the capital to start the idea and they think that's enough to coast them through. Yeah. So according to Mark, the socialist stage would be where that unfairness was done away with. You would basically okay. kind of have the same, you know, industrial output or whatever, uh, the same economy, but now with the workers in charge, you don't have that exploitation happening. So with the okay. workers in so, charge, they're paying themselves and, you know, they're, they're giving everyone what they deserve. They're not going for a profit, you know. So yeah. And you, this could be a whole nother topic, too. But like, I mean, we, we can dive into that maybe on another episode of like, how do you determine like, like how would a worker run workplace work? Oh, yeah. that's. <laughs> I just said work thing. a lot. Yeah. yeah like, I mean is anyone in charge at the end of the day? Is it just like a fucking thing by committee? Because I've done enough projects by committee that that is very painful to do. Um, Like how you determine what's fair and stuff like that. So that's a whole nother topic. For sure. Uh, For listeners that are looking for a resource in the interim till we get to that, I would point them toward uh, Richard D. Wolf's uh, podcast um, or YouTube channel. Uh, He's really good on that. Uh, in terms of worker co-ops, like that's what he is big time advocating for all the time. So okay. I think it's, Oh, is that that cute old man you played for me one time? Uh, yeah, probably economic update, I think is the name of the podcast. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he's, he's good on that. And that's his big thing is worker co-ops. So it's a good okay. resource there, but we'll definitely cool. get on that at some point. Cool. Uh, socialist stage workers are in charge. They're running thing. They're running the factories. They're running, the you know the auto assembly lines they're making okay. the decisions they're doing the things all right man i'm like realizing i genuinely thought that was communism i thought socialism was just like hey you get you get medicare the for government all. does nice things yeah <laughs> the government does nice things for you which it, that sounds cool too but well you know yeah marx was in you know kind of in favor of taking political power like that too like the gov- the workers would be in charge of the government as well oh but okay marx really thought that the big motion uh, movement was going to be in 
industry in the factories. Okay, in, yeah, in yeah, because that, that's what I was confused about. It's like we're talking only about economics instead mm -hmm. of politics, which obviously they're related, but yeah, to Marx they were intertwined, and politics came from the economics, right? The means of production. I mean, which it does. <laughs> yeah. From there, the next development is a peaceful one. All right. Contrary to all the other ones. And uh, <laughs> this one's a peaceful one. Basically, uh, once socialism uh, has come into play, you're going to have a lot less exploitation, a lot, you know, there, people aren't starving and dying in the streets. A lot of your social ills uh, start going away. Uh, maybe gradually, but they, you know, people are able to better solve them since they're less fighting with each other all the time. You develop the forces of industry and uh, productive, like productive capacity, like your ability to to yeah. feed everybody and and house everybody and and do all this. So much so that there isn't really. Uh, eventually, there's no concern for making sure everybody has enough because there's so much. Okay, so scarcity Post becomes not scarcity. a thing. If you've watched Star Trek Next Generation, yeah, they essentially are talking about not communism per se, but they have reached that post scarcity stage. All right, yeah, they're, yeah, they have fucking food generators or whatever they're called. Yeah, the replicators. replicators? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's what you'd be talking once you have replicator technology, basically, or you know, at least so much that you don't have to worry about that. Uh, the state would wither away. Okay. You wouldn't have the need to have a state administering any, anything. What are they doing? They're not solving any problems. There aren't any more problems. If this sounds strange, it is a utopia. Strange. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It's. It's what Marx decided that you know, kind of looking at things like, hey, this. I mean, this kind of seems like it would logically progress that way. I guess assuming all things kind of work out, but um, yeah, communism would be this utopian state completely classless uh, where people could work just if they want to work on something, you know, basically you'd just be hanging out doing your hobbies or, you know, or whatever. All right. Uh, so like an artist utopia. <laughs> yeah. Like you don't have to commit to any one career. You don't have to, you know, do any particular thing. Uh, you know, damn, I got to get up and go to work. Like just don't like whatever. Uh, this is crazy. The, the phrase changes to from each according to his ability to each according to his need. That's the more famous phrase of his. And okay. that refers to communism where it doesn't matter, dude, what you did. Like if you're working, if you're not, who cares? You're, you're, I you're mean, good. like, okay. So like, we literally can't have communism for a very long time, <laughs> right? Like there's never been a communist government then because yeah. there's no such thing as post scarcity. So, like, would it be incorrect to be like, oh, Russia was communist or whatever? Correct. Yeah. Um, well, so <laughs> uh, the <laughs> they were governed by a communist party. Communists okay. are people who, you know, communist parties would be some a, a party dedicated to bringing that about. Okay. So you, you can still be a communist. You just, yeah, you're, you want that utopia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And there's different flavors of it. I, I There's so many different stripes of socialism yeah. and communism. That this is just basically what Marx said about it, and only very okay. briefly boiled down to it. There are so many other, you know, theories of what communism might look like, theories of what socialism might can look like, all these different uh, ideas. So, like, yeah. Okay, and we'll get into those, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But that's the that's the big picture: is socialism is supposed to be kind of a stage on the way to communism, which okay. brings up an interesting question that you might be more interested in uh, when you talk to somebody and they say, uh, you know, Hey, I'm a socialist. And the other person's like, loser, I'm a communist. Like what yeah, are they, okay. what are they arguing about? You know what I mean? Yeah, that's true. I mean, I mean, I'm sure there's people out there though that are like, no, I, I just want to stay in the socialist zone. Yes, there definitely are. Um, or people who say, you know, uh, the other part doesn't make sense. Like we can't get that. Like, let's, yeah, let's like, please try to just do what we can do. And like, if it happens, it happens. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and there's also degrees of socialism as well in terms of what people want there in, in terms of means and ends. Um, pe people differ in terms of, Hey, let's have a revolution or let's have small reforms. Um, let's do this slowly. Let's do this quickly. Um, oh yeah. 
And then like, should there be a state in charge? Should it just be workers councils? Like all this stuff. So it's really yeah. widespread in terms of the, the differences there, but that's kind of the basic setup is communists okay. would be, if you're looking at the basic political spectrum, communists would be further left. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, I want to try to summarize Yeah. because I'm a good student and I want to get an A. Um, I always have to get an A. Um, so socialism would be workers are in charge um, and people are people are cared for, basically. Right. Is everyone cared for? Everyone's. Well, yeah, everyone's cared for. OK, because I, a lot of this talk is like you do work and you get compensated and stuff like that. And I, I kind of start thinking about like, well, about people like with disabilities mm-hmm. and chronic illness and like people just can't work. Like, what do you what do you do with that? So technically it would be up to the people. OK. This is uh, basically an application of democracy to everything. Um, in true democracy, not so. A true democracy, <laughs> not not our bullshit one. Right? Yeah, not electoralism or anything like that. True people deciding for themselves. All right. So theoretically, okay. I guess if you had you know asshole nation A, they could be like, no, we don't want to do that. And if you you know, then I mean, yeah. they could do that. You can't I guess. work. You're fucked. Yeah. But, yeah, um, but if you had enough people that were like, no, we should provide for everyone. Yeah, and actu- actual, so you know, good socialists, not like you know, crappy national socialists or something, <laughs> would would say, yeah, you know, let's look out for people, let's let's provide for people. the The general idea being, what if it's me? You know, what if mm-hmm. you know, I ended up there? Just you know? more fucking empathy. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, socialists workers are in charge. They hopefully provide for everybody and. They're basically running true democracy. And then at some point, they're so good at working together yeah. that some scientist is like, I can make food now. Um, and now you're into full communism where everybody can just chill, basically. Everybody can just chill. <laughs> Sounds like a party. It is I a party. Uh, there's a there's a great quote. In just a second, let me see. Quote me. Not like quote me, but but lay that quote on me. Oh, my dog is sleeping. He looks great. There's a great quote from Marx describing this for, uh, phase of, of communism, what you could do just basically that you don't have to tie yourself down to anything. You can do whatever, whatever you want. You know, he says, I could fish in the morning, hunt in the afternoon, rear cattle in the evening and do critical theory at night, just as I have a mind. This, this is Stardew Valley. Yeah. Or an, okay. I was thinking about this the other day. This I would love to do a whole Animal Crossing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's Animal Crossing, it's Stardew Valley. But they still have money, so they're still socialists, right? But at the same time, you don't have to. Like, Animal Crossing, you can fucking stay in the tent the whole time if you want to. Yeah, I mean, they have... So <laughs> there's different theories on this, too. But, like, basically, in communism you could, or socialism, more socialism, so you could have, like, money and stuff for mm-hmm. surplus or luxury things. Uh, this is more of a socialist idea that basically everything would be provided for that someone needs to survive. So uh, basic stuff, yeah. Yeah, and and really not even just like get by, but like you know thrive, good things, um, comfortable, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then like things that would be decided by markets would be frivolous things. Uh, okay. Things that it's just like, well, we don't have all of the things, you know, we don't have enough of these to go around. Yeah. So that, that's Animal Crossing, basically. I could chill in my tent and like just while away my hours fishing and whatever, or I can like really game it and like you know build a house with like six rooms or whatever. Yeah, yeah, you can do okay. pretty much. Uh, <laughs> this is my new metaphor for socialism. It's only going to be Animal Crossing. Sorry, y'all. This is now an Animal Crossing podcast. <laughs> Send me those dodo codes. <laughs> yes, do it. Um, so yeah, no, that's the, that's the, uh, kind of the ideal, this utopia is, it's just hanging out, Animal Crossing, Stardew Valley, uh, uh, whatever, you know, you're, you're, you're good. You don't have to, you can do whatever you want. Uh, you know, you can do all those things without ever becoming one of those things. You're just hanging out, you know? That's pretty rad. Yeah. It's. Why are, why are people against that? Are they stupid? I know they, (laughs) uh, they are skeptics. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's fair. I mean, I, yeah. My first thought is like that. That seems impossible. But I'm also like, I don't know. I feel like we could figure out a food replicator. <laughs> I mean, I mean, if if every everyone stopped what they're doing and worked on that, maybe. I also I think my first thought would also be, you know, 
environmentally how would that work which we could do a whole up on like eco-communism very yeah that's that would be very important adding it to the notes i think that you know skeptics are are point to say you know which a very foolish criticism of them is saying like oh you know marx never considered human nature marx was a fucking philosopher he definitely considered human nature that was like his job like where he came from on all this you know (laughs) it's it's, it's, come on uh that's why it's grounded in (laughs) self-interest like the whole the whole mechanism here is not people saying oh i'm gonna go fight for other people it's hey we're getting screwed over let's make this better for ourselves you know yeah, that's what I like about it. It's like, I mean, I I try to be empathetic and stuff, but I do like that this framework is like, hey, this this is going to be good for you personally, because mm-hmm. I feel like that helps win people over. That's why it has been such a powerful historical force is because of that. It's it's easy to ra- rally workers to this. Um, and, you know, workers kind of have a a feeling of this at some on, on some level, like it sounds right. It's like, yeah, my boss, you know. Even even a nice boss is still oh, yeah. somewhat taking advantage of me. I get yeah, that. I've had very nice bosses, and I'm still at the end of the day like you could pay me more. <laughs> yeah, like people like, get okay. That. Another another resource I want to bring up is the book Bullshit Jobs, which you gave me. Ah, yeah. Um, and it's very good. I liked it because you know I came into it a baby socialist, and by the end of it, I was like learning more about communism and stuff. But the book kind of sneaks up on you. It's just like, hey, you know how like. Most jobs you have time to dick around and like it's chill and like, you know, they give tons of anecdotes about that. And at the end of the day, they're like, yeah, we could just like have a four hour work week and we could just like, (laughs) you know, like do all this stuff. And like, yeah, your bosses are definitely screwing you over. They think you own they own your time and all this stuff. And like it by the end of it, it's like, hey, you've been radicalized. Congratulations. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, David Graeber is great. I I believe he's a he's an anarchist of some stripe. Um, Oh, yeah. I want to learn more about that, too. I have a friend that's an anarchist and I'm like. What's what's your deal? <laughs> Anarchism is good stuff if it's done right. I mean, because there's yeah, there's different stripes of it, um, you know. But good anarchists are like anarcho-communists, anarcho-socialists, that sort of thing. Yes, that, that's um, what he is, an anarcho-communist. That's hard to say for me. Yeah, um, if you get anarcho-capitalists are just hyper-capitalists, basically. Um, yeah, that sounds bad. I don't want that. So if you if you think <laughs> about it, it'd be like a, a teenager or something thinking, you know, hey, I'm grown up. I'm an adult. I can do whatever. You know, I can take care of myself without having ever actually done that. That's mm-hmm. you know, they 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 don't know the first thing about like paying bills or getting by or whatever. <laughs> that would be an anarcho-capitalist, uh, right? They okay. they're like, I don't need the state. I can do this. Not realizing really how much the state like how expensive shit is. Yeah, Yeah. like the state really guarantees your position. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, okay, that kind of makes sense. Now we should do. Gosh, this whole episode is just like we should do an episode about this. (laughs) Uh, Hey, hey man, we're gonna have we're gonna have several of those probably going forward because we're in that stage. This episode is an ad for other episodes. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, come back. A promo trailer. Yeah. But yeah, I guess that's the the big difference there in socialism and communism. I guess we kind of covered it. Uh, And the difference in socialists and communists can be a lot just in terms of their their different variations. Yeah, I think that helps, though. What really helped me was that distinction between, like, communist governments and communism, the idea, because... Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm not I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but I think it was a good connection to make that like, hey, like no one actually has a communist government because we don't have food replicators and like and it, endless resources. Yeah. And it's an oxymoron itself. The state is supposed to fall away. There's not. Yeah, supposed that was to be very surprising to me. I thought the communism was like all state all the time. No. See, that's the American conception of it. When the government does more things, that's more communism, you know, uh, uh-huh. but that's not. Uh, that's so weird. Why? Yeah. Wait, why? <laughs> I, I think, you know, part of it might be honest confusion in terms of the communist parties, right? The, they are in control in a, in a kind of totalitarian state. Okay. So their method to getting to communism was like, yeah, let's do a ton of state shit. Yeah. And, and where it's been practiced has, has generally been either a Marxist-Leninist or a Maoist uh, way to do it. We don't have to get into what that is, basically, but okay. uh, Marxism, Leninism, Marxism, Leninism is kind of important in that its uh, its theory was the theory of a vanguard party. Lenin basically said, "There's no way all these people in Russia uh, in Russia are going to figure out communism in time. Figure out, uh, you know, how to how to combine together in their class interests without somebody mm-hmm. provoking them." 
and we need okay. a dedicated organi- organized party of of uh, of the vanguard, the experts, the ones who who know this shit can go out there and be like, "Hey workers, we need to you know, we need to do stuff. We need to organize, we need to agitate." I mean, that kind of makes sense. Yeah, well that's that's one of the key developments and then once they uh, you know, can take power th- that vanguard party needs to be in charge of that dictatorship of the proletariat. Like, the proletariats are in charge now. See, that part doesn't make sense. Well, it's just the proles taking power. That seems like an oxymoron. That seems like an oxymoron of, like, a dictatorship of proletariats, because I thought the point was everybody's in charge. Yeah, but in the... Well, uh, sure. Yeah, everyone should be in charge, but ev- you still have bourgeoisie, like, around. Right? You're okay. still taking land from them. You're still, you know... Uh, saying you're a worker now, you know, you're, you're just like us and you have a lot of resistance. Um, another episode I think we already talked about doing is on Russia, right? Um, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Russia was, you know, invaded, uh, as soon as it's once, once they went through the revolution, they were invaded by lots of different countries, including the United States, um, in the Russian civil war, like all trying to prop up the old czar government and and destroy the reds. Wait, were we Uh, in there? Hmm. Were we in there? Yeah, for that? the United States was Shit, in there. I didn't know that. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. All my Russian history I know from Anastasia <laughs> and parts of Downton Abbey. Oh, yeah. And Branson's <laughs> like, yeah, they did it. Um, yeah. And then, like, Violet has that, that guy that's into her. Um, he was like an ex. He was a Russian prince or something. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. I have Downton Abbey on the brain. I just watched the finale. Ah, uh, I haven't. I, n- I didn't finish it. The finale was bad. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the um, last season is literally like, it's it's like so many shows where it's just like, everyone gets married and has babies. And it's just like, why why is that the narrative, y'all? Can we do better? <laughs> uh, what were we on? Mm, I feel like we're summing up. Yeah. We were Some, t- you were talking about Russia, but yeah. Yeah, we don't have to get too much into that. But I guess part of the confusion comes from the communists, uh, the you know, the states governed by communist parties being very totalitarian. I think is what yeah, I was trying yeah. to get Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm still dealing with that that revelation. The whole the state falling away is, was quite surprising to me. Yeah. I, I did not see that coming. <laughs> it's that's the that's the twist in in the last season. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, I feel I feel like I got a good grasp on it. All right. Awesome. It's like you're a teacher or something. It's similar to that. Yeah, it's it's as if. <laughs> <laughs> um, should we move on to our our little recurring segment that I would like to try? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, let's let's go to the organization corner, um, which sounds like a great place for me, someone who does like to have things organized. Yeah. Um, but I, it's where it's where we learn about what practical steps we can take today, because I I don't want this to be all theory, you know. Yeah, theory can get dry after after long enough, you know. Yeah, oh, not necessarily that, but like I don't know, I get very. I get downtrodden on this stuff. I'm like, man, yeah, I do want a utopia, but like, what the fuck can I do about it? So that's that's what this is for. And by organizing, we mean like ways you can um, improve your like class condition, like like right, getting together with people and and you know and and actually putting some of this into action. Yeah. So yeah, let's let's talk about what what organizing is because that is. Oh my gosh, that's the call to action to so many things. Like, fucking organize, go out there and organize. I'm like, organize what? Like, what, what am I doing here? Yeah, like, people don't usually add context <laughs> to that at all, right? Just yeah, go organize. They just say, go do it. If you, were, if you were to take that advice, you know, and just Google, you know, how to organize, you're going to get organization tips. You're going to get how to fucking straighten <laughs> your drawers and, and your cabinets and make sure. It's just uh, Mario Kondo or whatever. <laughs> yeah, does this bring me joy? No, but when we talk about organizing, what we mean there is getting people in, uh, getting proletariat or anybody, when we say that word, we mean anybody who like works, you know, okay. who's not a boss. Okay. So that's, yeah, that's another term that's thrown around a lot as proles, proletariat. Yeah. It's not like wage workers, salary workers, different or anything like that. It's just, do you, do you work for somebody? Okay. Do you, do you have a boss? You know, and you have middle management and stuff and they're, they're kind of different, say. but, um, but generally, yeah. Are, if you're in charge of somebody, you're you. There, there's an, a gray area there, maybe. So there's a spectrum between prole and and bourgeoisie. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> generally, though, if you work for somebody, then you know you're not the capitalist class. You know, you're not. You're okay, not yeah. The bourgeoisie. So, like in a larger organization, it's like, you know, if you're at the very bottom, like a lot of 
businesses have like C-level and like executive level or whatever. They have like different levels. Ah, okay. I don't know that I much I don't know about if you it, know so. this. No. <laughs> I'm part of the corporate world, world or I have yeah, been. Public sector guy over here. <laughs> um, yeah, right. And so you have like, it's, it's called like C-level executives or whatever. And those are like, your, that's your CEO, that's your CFO, all that bullshit. Ah, okay. And then you have like department heads and then you have middle management and then you have like, Hey, I just now hired you like just regular workers. Mm-hmm. So I feel like for that, there could be a spectrum. Like my boss could still be part of the proletariat cause he still has a boss. I, I do this thing where I call people who are my boss's boss. I call them my grand boss. <laughs> so, so grand bosses are more, are more bourgeois. That's a little, yeah, that's a little too affectionate. We might have to toss your grand bosses <laughs> into a wagon sometimes. So, Oh, that's fine. I don't, I don't <laughs> care. I, I I say that with a lot of skepticism. <laughs> okay, all right, yeah. Don't get too close to your grand bosses, listeners. Uh, no, no, they're they're okay, but yeah, uh, I hey, agree. This uh, future topic or something to bring up in a future episode about like when we start talking about organizing more in more detail, organizing workplaces and stuff is the bullshit mm-hmm. about we're more of a family here. Oh, that's my least favorite thing. Yeah. Oh, there's so many forced happy hours. And force like fun activities and oh, all that stuff. I hate it so so much. I'm like, I, you are not paying me to be friends with these people. Like, I like most of my coworkers, but also like, hey, that's that's not part of my job description. All of that is uh, part of a general anti-union tactic. Like, that's that's mm-hmm. what it is. It's rolled into okay. it. It's subtle, but it's that's okay. What I added to. it to the list. Oh, you wouldn't do this to grand boss. You know, you wouldn't do this to exactly. <laughs> I'm your old grand boss. I'm just looking out for you. Yeah. Yeah, I hate that stuff. I hate, like, we have a lot of CEO town halls and stuff like that. We're just like, I'm just a regular guy talking to my employees. Yeah. And it's just, and, like, there's so many things, like, people are asking, like, what what are you doing during quarantine? And, like, asking these questions to, like, CEOs and stuff. And it's just like, I, I don't care. Like, they're not, I'm not friends with this person. Yeah, it's PR. <laughs> that's 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 old down-home me, you know. Oh, you can. Yeah. Yeah. All shucks, you know. <laughs> Oh shucks! I own all of you. But yeah, when we're talking about organizing, just to kind of get us oh, yeah, back yeah. in the room, we're talking about organizing. We're talking about anything that you can do to raise class consciousness, broadly speaking. So just bringing workers, uh, like we said, anybody who's responding to bosses and stuff, bringing them uh, into greater awareness of their position of their you know situation okay applying it to them i was gonna ask if we could have a a more specific definition of class consciousness because that's another term sure it gets thrown around a lot uh class consciousness is just knowing where you are in this situation knowing that uh because america is great about this right we are you know we don't have classes in america (laughs) you know we everyone has a chance bootstraps all that right you can make anything of yourself Uh, But you do. And class consciousness, uh, you know, there are classes. Class consciousness is is breaking away that veil and saying, no, 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 there are classes and you're in one and you're in the proletariat. You sell your labor. Mm -hmm. That's the class you're in. These are your class interests. Uh, Basically make people realize, oh, yeah, you're right. You know, I do want to get more pay. I do want to, you know, have more than I currently have. I do want to have more of a say than I currently have more control over my life than I currently have, that sort of thing. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, I I like that you bring up that veil of class not existing here because, yeah, everyone says they're middle class. Like, and I'm guilty of that, too. Like, everyone's like, oh, I'm just middle class, even if they're, like, dirt fucking poor or because they don't want to admit that they're poor or even if they're, like, really fucking rich. Mm -hmm. Like, I know people who, who should not say that they're middle class and still do. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's... And that's America teaches you that, you know, it's, it's, we're all fair. It's all mm-hmm, fair. Mm-hmm. We're all. Everyone gets with a meritocracy. Yeah. Ugh, um, but blow me. class consciousness is saying meritocracy. No, this is rigged. This is against you. You uh, are, you know, at the mercy of these people and you don't have to be, you know, you can, you can do something about it and maybe not okay. today or tomorrow, but eventually things can change if enough of us get together. Okay. Um, I know one of our future episodes is going to be on like capitalism in general, but I would love to talk more about like America's particular flavor of capitalism because like we, we are sold so many lies and like, I, I just want to figure out like, how can we fucking tell people that the, these are, these are bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> like, especially the, the whole class thing that it's just like entirely 
it, it's a lot of it's pride based. And I, I don't know how to get people to admit like, hey, you're being fucked over because everyone wants to think like, no, I'm, I, I can get there one day. Yeah. Uh, the, the old quote of temper, you know, Americans are all none of them are working class. They're all just temporarily embarrassed millionaires. Exactly. You know, everyone thinks about, oh, well, what if I'm rich instead of, oh, well, what if I'm poor? You know, like, yeah, exactly. Okay, um, back to organizi- organizing. That's raising class consciousness, yeah. basically. And so okay. that can be anything from very low tier, you know, uh, posting. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that can be kind of okay. <laughs> Usually you're like preaching to p- other people who find that stuff entertaining. So you're not really organizing generally unless you accidentally reach people who are just kind of dabbling. And then you might, you know. You might accidentally yeah. do some organizing. So this podcast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This podcast is very low tier organizing. Yeah. Um, actual organizing, like the highest form, I think, would be unionizing, you know, dr- trying to trying to unionize your workplace and also taking labor actions. Like if you're if, if you form a union or a, even better, like a combination of different unions to put, you know, put on strike actions and things mm, yeah, yeah. to not only improve your conditions, but demand, you know, more out of society itself. You know, the biggest, the holy grail of organizing is the general strike. Hell yeah. Where we all just say, nope, you know, <laughs> but that takes, oh. that should take to, to be effective. That should take a lot of groundwork action before then. You want to make sure that like, you aren't just putting on a one day little show for the capitalists to say, that's fine. I'll lose money today and I'll get you tomorrow. You want to actually, you know, cripple the system if you do that. Yeah. I feel like a lot of like strikes, strike organization, whatever you want to call it. A lot of that is like, I feel like it's a game of chicken. It's just like, fine, you'll come back. You know, like I I don't know how to get around the fear around it. Mm -hmm. And I know that fear is put there on purpose. Obviously they're like, yeah, you've got to live. But, yeah. like, I don't know how to get past that. I mean, like, people are always like, what about scabs? And I'm like, I don't have a solution for you. Like, that's probably going to happen. Uh, part, we'll definitely do some episodes on labor uh, vi- violence and, and strikes and strike breaking and, and uh, the great some of the great ones in the past. Yeah. Because it is brutal. Um, I don't think that capitalists are, you know, you are foolish if you think that they're just that the class struggle will resolve itself like peacefully in this one. Like maybe the socialism yeah. communism one, but capitalism and socialism, <laughs> uh, there, you know, people don't give up power, uh, and just say, oh, shucks, you know, I know that one scares me because like, I listen to a lot of stuff that's like, fuck yeah, it's going to be a revolution. It's going to be violent. And I'm like, Oh, I can't fight. <laughs> <laughs> if it is a big societal wide thing all at once, like a Vanguard party sort of, yeah, I mean, it would be a bloody, situation Ugh, i'm very squishy i'm not built for physical <laughs> activity that one's gonna be rough on me well when you're talking though about organizing and stuff any of any labor actions can end up like strikes and stuff can end up violent if they're big enough mm-hmm. and stuff but you also have a lot of people with you and you're not if we're not talking violent like you're gonna need an ak or something like not mm-hmm. nothing like that it's just oh good i'm scared of guns no yeah i mean I don't know. It can play out a number of different ways. And really, when we're talking about, hey, what can you do to organize? We're not really saying, hey, you're going to have to get out there and fight the strike breakers. Okay. Yeah. Um, Okay. Yeah. We're mostly just talking about if you can increase labor union participation and stuff, there's a greater chance that you can actually do things more peacefully. Yeah. Okay. So getting everyone on board means you're not going to have scabs. Right. I'll put it like this. Okay. Let's say you go out into your yard. Oh, if I had a yard. (laughs) Yeah. You go out, you go out somewhere in a nice field in the park or something, and you see a small little ant hill or, or a small little bug or something. Um, mm-hmm. You can pretty easily step on that if you want to and crush that. Mm-hmm. It's not a problem. You don't think twice, really. If you want to, you can kill that real easy. Let's say you go out there and you find a humongous, tall as you ant hill. That'd be horrifying. You are not gonna fuck with that. No. Okay. We okay. need to become. As big, you know, as big of an anthill as we can, we need to become as big of a threat as we can before capital comes in and, and, and crushes us. All right. So the organizing steps should be small and seem like we're not trying to put them out in the street yet until we are to the, you know, to Ooh, a, like a sneak attack. Yeah. Until you're of a sufficient size and sufficient capabilities, you shouldn't say, oh, we're going to, you know, we're going to take this place over until you have the numbers to do so. 
Okay. I'm putting your metaphor in a nerdy ass way. Um, so we play D&D together. So yeah. <laughs> in D&D, when you fight just one enemy, it's real fucking easy. Like, it's just it's just not a problem, especially if you have a party of like four or five people. Mm-hmm. But as soon as, like, it's like an exponential thing. When you add another enemy, it gets that much harder. And, like, eventually it can be a super deadly fight, even if they're all, like, fucking, you know, goblins or something really easy or bandits. As soon as you add more people, it gets that much harder to fight. Yes. Like, I've put you guys against a fucking dragon, and it wasn't hard because there's just one fucking dragon. So, like, yeah, you have to have a lot of people. Yes, exactly. That's the concept of solidarity is we're are are more powerful in numbers and the concept of organizing is we increase those numbers okay i like it gradually 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 and eventually we can do stuff okay so i think next time on this corner we talk about some of those gradual steps yeah let's do that maybe we do it sequentially like baby's first organizing what do you do (laughs) i like it yeah we can we can for sure we kind of gave the definition this time next time we can say okay here are some small things you can do yeah cool Okay, I think we should wrap up. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I think so too. What's our uh, What's our next topic? What do you want to learn about next? Um, well, we talked a lot about Marx this week, and we're gonna do it again next week, I think, because I think we should we should read that little red book everyone's told me so much about. The Communist Manifesto. Yeah, that one. All right. Yeah, we can do that. I want to. I gotta start with a question right away. Is it really little and red? Uh, the one I'm reading online is red bordered uh <laughs> it's got like i a mean red like original publication the original publication i don't think it was red i think it was just pamphlets you know like oh yeah yeah but it is like short yeah it's pretty short all right cool so if you listen to all that hey thanks um you can find us wherever you listen to podcasts which i guess you've already figured out if you're listening to this but i don't know um you can follow us on social um teach me communism and did you set up our Gmail yet? I did. Yeah, that's at teachmecommunism at gmail.com. That's teachmecommunism at gmail.com. That'll be in the show notes, too. You can check that out. Uh, and you can send us ideas for future episodes, questions. Uh, you know, if we get enough questions, we can do like a little listener's question sort of. Oh, I'd love that. Segment, you know, that would be cool. That would be great. All right. Yeah. And I bet I, you know, we talked about some resources here. We should throw those in there as well. Like all the books we've, we've name dropped. Oh yeah. Uh, what did we name drop? We name drop David Graver's, uh, bullshit yeah, jobs, bullshit jobs, uh, the communist man. That's not really the communist manifesto. <laughs> though. Guys, have uh, you heard of the communist? Richard D. Wolf's podcast, uh, called economic update. And he also has a mm-hmm. YouTube channel. That's, that's interesting as well. He has, he's very good at breaking things down simply, uh, know odd for a professor maybe but he's yeah. he's good at it and there was the uh marriage a history the book by stephanie Kuntz that you mentioned uh about the historical development of marriage um what else do we reference i think those are the main ones yeah we'll figure it out all right okay <laughs> all right well thanks for for teaching me communism yeah anytime uh we'll we'll be back in what are we doing a week yeah let's do a week all right i ain't got anything going on it's, it's this and writing D, so like i'm open awesome well yeah, we'll be back in a week with another episode of teach me communism uh, where the class struggle is always in session all right 